So last week in our um, sort of our Father's Day message, we did a high view, high overview of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and it got me thinking along the lines of, I wanted to go a little bit further down into the book of Genesis, and, and there is so much richness in the book of Genesis that I, I just, I couldn't pass this up, and I know that we've sort of kind of stepped into the book of Hebrews, but I thought we'd just postpone that for a little bit and just jump deeper into the book of Genesis for a while because I just, I mean, there's so much rich teaching and theology and just some amazing stuff in the text that I, I, I think is, is definitely going to be challenging, but it's also going to be encouraging to us as believers. And, and so... We're just going to jump in. We, like I said, we did a high overview of 1, 2, and 3. And we're going to just drill down the last part of 3. And then we'll kick off onto 4 next week. Um, but last week we saw Adam and Eve sinned and thrust the entire human race into darkness. If you remember, in the first part of Genesis chapter 3, Satan weasels his way into the garden and he bypasses the man and goes straight to the woman and then causes her to doubt God. Satan is doing the exact same thing in 2024 that he did in the Garden of Eden. He's, it's, he doesn't have a new playbook. He doesn't have a different plan. He doesn't have a different anything. It's the same exact playbook and humans are just silly and we, we fall for it every time. Satan is trying to get people to doubt the word of God. Doubt the authenticity, the authority, the truth of God's word. That is what Satan does. And so, Adam and Eve sin. They disobey God. They fall into this trap set by Satan saying, Did God really say that you'd die if you eat this fruit? Did he? And they both looked at it and they said, it's beautiful to eat. It looks like it could be nourishing. I'm going to just jump in and do it. And so they eat. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Sin enters the equation. They are, the scales have fallen off and they can see right and wrong. And sin shatters everything. And so... The consequences of disobedience are real. And so that's sort of the, the title of today's message would be the consequences of disobedience, but the hope of forgiveness. So that is where we're going to be. And we're going to start in verse 16. So chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3 and looking at verse 16. To the woman... He said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. So for the ladies, childbirth, I guess at some point, childbirth wasn't a problem. I Listen, I told Jamie it wasn't a problem for me, but uh, she's, not, I know, she's not here to defend herself, so I'll be quiet, right? All right, but this, this is what ends up happening is... This is part of the consequences of the fall, is that childbearing becomes difficult. There was a season and a time when childbearing was not a difficult thing. It was, I don't know if it was a joy, but it wasn't hard. It wasn't difficult. It wasn't painful. How do we know? Because now it is. And how do we know it's become that? Because God says to the woman, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. So this is, this is part of the fall. The next thing we see in the text is that, that that's number one, is we see that childbearing is going to be hard and it's going to be difficult. And number two, and this one is more, pers, pers, uh, it, it infiltrates more parts of society than we realize. The next part of the text. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. One translation says, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Ladies, as part of the fall, 
you have a default setting. When you were born, you have a default desire to be over and control your husbands. And not just your husband, but men in general. That is a, that is a, that is a thing that's been put in us or put in you by the fall. Feminism is as old as the fall itself. And this is back to the the idea of of the lie that has been laid out. Feminism does not free women or set them free to be who they were designed to be. It actually shackles you into a construct that was designed by Satan himself. Feminism is the shackling down of women. The idea that God and his design of who you are as a woman is not truly complete. It's lacking or it's falling apart unless you are in control. And I, and I, wa- I want you to look around the world today. Women have a desire to be in places of power. They, they are not interested in working in construction and working in, in digging ditches. Now, they, I know that sometimes that takes place. But their innate desire, like when it was 12 degrees out and I, there was a bridge being built in Bartlesville and it was, I mean, a big, big, big bridge construction. And when it was 10, 15, 12 degrees outside, I did not see ladies jump and say, you know what? I want that job. I need that job. I want it now. Give me that job. It was the men who had that job. Now, what do typically women want? They want the job where they're in the office dictating the rules and the, the measures for men to do what they need to do. That's the desire of a woman, is to be in control of a man. And it, it, it most, most frequently has come out in marriages where the woman has the, and how do we know? The scripture says this. This is, not, this is not thus saith Caleb. This is not my opinion. This is what God's word says. God's word says you as a woman, as a wife, will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. That's going to be, that's the, that's the desire. Wives want to control their husbands and act and tell them what to do. But the word says, at the end of the day, they don't get what they want. This is the result of the fall. Fellas, you're next. (laughs) Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Now, why is the ground cursed? Why is your wife's uh, desire to be over you? Because of you, fellas. Because you abdicated your role. Let's keep going, keep reading. In pain shall you eat of it all day long, all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth for you, and you shall eat the the, the plants of the field. Why? So because you, ab- fellas, because you abdicated your role, because you ignored your God-given authority, because you set aside your dominion, what happens? Everything is going to war against you. Your wife, the ground, your children, your job, everything is going to war against you you as a man this is this is what happens when sin enters the equation pre-sin there was no conflict husbands and wives didn't argue and didn't have the desire to try to control one another they didn't have that there was a god set it in motion and said okay adam you're in charge you have dominion take care of your wife love her name the animals You're naked and unashamed. That's the end of chapter 2. Right? Then chapter 3 enters into this equation. And they eat and they have these things. And they do all the stuff that they wanted to do. And it causes chaos. So everything is going to war against you as a man. The ground you work is cursed. 
The job you work is going to war against you. Just when you think, okay, I've got it all figured out. The job is doing awesome. The kids are doing great. The wife is awesome. All of a sudden, something happens and something falls apart. Just when you get your house where you want it to be, a board falls. The sink blows up. Something. Amen? Why is that? And, why, and, and how many of us as men, when that happens, we're like, oh, that's awesome. I've been waiting for that thing to pop. Nobody in the room's excited for that. Something blows up and you're just like, are you kidding me? Seriously? Why does that happen? Because of sin. Because we live in a fallen state. Everything will war against you. This is what God's word says. Then look at verse 19. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. That means you're going to work, fellas. By the sweat of your face, you're going to be able to eat. You're going to have to work and work hard till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken and from or, or for you. I'm sorry. You shall eat the eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. Ooh. Wow. Like that's, that's hard. So because you were designed to have dominion, it's going to work. Now you, listen, I, I heard a guy, Joe Rigney, um, I, I just ordered his book, Emotional Sabotage. I'm looking forward to starting to read that. Um, but we have this, this misconception. It's not a matter of if men rule, they do. And what kind of a leader are you? What kind of a ruler are you? Are you a godly man who rules and leads as you should? Or are you an ungodly man who abdicates and sort of kind of set, sets everything aside and just lets the woman run things? If, you, if, that's, if that's your leadership style, your house is probably a house of chaos. And because you were designed to have dominion, it's going to take work. You're going to struggle to lead. You're not, listen, men's default, you know, I talked about ladies' default position. Men's default position is, all right, you want to do it? I'll just step aside and let you do it. Because I don't want to have the fight. I don't want to have the argument. I don't want to have the whatever. Because we don't want to be, we don't... Most of the time, men don't want to have conflict. We're just like, okay. Sometimes we're backed into a corner. Now you back a brother into a corner, look out. But most of the time, guys don't want that. It's going to be a, it's going to be a struggle. It's going to take work to lead right. And you're going to struggle to the day you die. And just, just like I said, when you get ahead, something's going to fall apart. The fight is going to be real until the day you take your last breath. But take heart. This is not, number one, this is not your permanent home. Amen? Can I get an amen from somebody? And number two, this is the reason we need Jesus. This is why we need Christ. This is why Jesus is better than everything else. That everything, listen, the fall fractures everything. It shatters relationships. It shatters friendships. It shatters marriages. It shatters creation itself. But Jesus then the, comes into play and he starts to do the work that is necessary to redeem everything that Adam messed up. So the next thing we see, we're going to keep going in the text here. Next thing we see in verse 20 is that Adam names his wife like he calls her Eve the man calls his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living things so he like I said he still has dominion even after the fall he still God gave him and tasked him with naming everything in the garden he then names his wife Eve verse 21 and the Lord made Adam and his wife garments of skin, and he clothed them. So I want you to see what God does here. Because God takes 
Now remember, when Adam and Eve sinned, what took place? The sacrificial system was instituted at this point. So Adam and Eve sin, they break God's law, and what do they do? If you remember, they go back in verse 3 of, or I'm sorry, verse 7 of chapter 3, what do they do? When they sinned, they ate the fruit, both of them, verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. And so what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves loincloths. So at this very moment, they eat the apple and they're like, oh, shoot, you're naked. Oh, shoot, you're naked. Crud. I got to go find some fig leaves and I'm going to sew together. My, I'm going to cover myself. It's one thing for a man to attempt to cover himself in his own self-righteousness, his own work. But it's another thing altogether different when Christ covers that man in his righteousness. So what did Adam and Eve do? They attempted to cover their sin and their own efforts and their own work and their own righteousness. They are like, okay, crud, we're naked. What are we going to do? Um, we go into fix-it mode. And this happens in today's world. When we sin, we go into fix-it mode. We're like, okay, crud, what do I need to do? Okay, uh, and we got to try to do what we need to do to fix it, right? We go into fix-it mode. And so they went into fix-it mode. Adam and Eve just, they're like, uh-oh, crud. We've done it. We've done what we shouldn't have done. And now they're trying to like fix the things, right? And, and all that does, when you attempt to, cover your own sin, when you try to cover yourself in your own self-righteousness, when you try to do it on your own efforts, all it brings is shame and reproach and exhaustion. Anybody in the room? Tried it? Been there, done that, got that t-shirt? Just, okay, crud, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my network, I'm going to use my skills, I'm going to use my, my abilities, my gifts, and I'm going to try to cover my sin. I'm going to try to fix it myself. I can do this, I can fix it, I'm a man. They both attempt to cover their sins with their own efforts. Then enters God. Jesus enters the garden in the cool of the evening and he calls to Adam, Adam, where are you? I don't know. I'm over here. Why are you hiding from me? I was naked and afraid and ashamed. Who told you you were naked? This is God talking to Adam. Right in the, right in the text. Who told you? It was that woman! You gave, her, you gave her to me. If I was, listen, I was totally happy in the garden running around naked and naming animals, having fun, building myself a fort. It was awesome. You put her in here. And then what's Eve do? It was the serpent. I was fine running around naked too. Got to have him here. This is what we as human beings do. Rather than owning the sin, what do we do? It's my spouse's fault that I'm a jerk. It's my kid's fault that I'm in a bad mood. It's my boss's fault that I'm the way I am. No, it's not. Own, own it. Own where you are. Stop trying to cover your own stuff. So Jesus enters the equation... And what does he do? Look at the text. And the Lord, verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. So it enters the sacrificial system. God takes a lamb, he slaughters that lamb, and pours that blood. We just sang there's power in the blood. He, I don't know why the Lord has seen fit to see that blood is the thing that brings forgiveness of sins, but that's the truth. Hebrews chapter 9 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So man, you better be thankful for the blood, because that is the only mechanism that brings you forgiveness and reconciliation. So the Lord slaughters this lamb, 
lays it on an altar, sheds its blood, and there was a sacrifice for the sins of Adam and Eve. And he takes the skins from that animal and then he covers them, takes off their own self-righteous acts, their own, the, the, the fig leaves, the, the man-made works. He removes that from them and then he clothes them in his way. He enters the situation and covers their sin with His righteousness. And when Jesus covers you, it is covering you to reconciliation, to forgiveness, to hope, to rescue. He comes in and He rescues them. This is what God does for His children. This is Romans chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. God forgives Adam and, and Eve of their sin. And this is the good news. is that God had every right. Like He told Adam and Eve very clearly, the day you eat of this fruit is the day you die. Remember? Now, they ate the fruit. Did they die? Yes. They died instantly in their spirit, progressively in their minds, and ultimately in their bodies. Jesus had to come back and fix it. So he forgives their sins, and this is the good news. God had every right to kill their physical bodies and just you know what, just start over. But he does not do that. He does not kill them in that very instant. He allows them to live another day. And then the plan is now in motion to buy back humanity. Because remember, in the beginning, Adam is given dominion and authority. He then hands that to Satan when he sins. That's what Satan wanted. Was He wanted dominion. He wanted authority. That's what he wants today. He wants dominion. He wants authority. And he wants to be worshipped. That's what he wants. So in brings the sacrificial system. God puts in place the sacrificial system that is the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins. He puts in place the lambs and the goats and the altars for for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the Passover, all these different things happen. Blood is shed in the foreshadowing of when the ultimate lamb would come, Jesus Christ, who would come and shed his blood on Calvary's cross to redeem all of those that would believe for all, throughout all time. And the day when God would come in the form of His Son to come and cover our sinfulness by dying on the cross of Calvary. This is the hope of humanity. So, well, Caleb, that sounds, that sounds great. Cool. So we're set then? Just because God forgives them of their sins, there's still consequences. So yes, we're going to talk about the consequences of disobedience in verse 22. But there is hope. So put a pin in hope. We'll, put, we'll be back to it. Verse 22. Then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So there was a sprinkle of truth in Satan's lie. That's how Satan does it. He makes lies believable by sprinkling, sprinkling a little bit of truth in there. Because he told Eve, Hey, God's trying to keep something from you. If you eat this, you're going to know good from evil. So there's the sprinkle of truth. God wasn't trying to hold anything back from Adam and Eve. God gave them everything they needed. Satan always pushes the idea of you're missing out. God doesn't really love you. You're missing out in that circle of friends. You're missing out. You're missing out. You're missing out. You're missing out. No, you're not. You're not. Just like rat poison, there's a little bit of food sprinkled in with a whole lot of poison. This is what Satan does. Behold, the man has become like one of us and he knows good from evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Could you imagine living forever in your sinful state? Gross. Never dying in your sinful state? That's hell. 
For if, you've out, if you're outside of Christ, get ready. You will live forever in hell in your sinful state. Gross. Verse 23. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and, the, and t- at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim. A cherubim is an insane, crazy an angelic strong creature <clears throat> and he had a i like to say he had a lightsaber but uh it's a is that not what a flaming sword is help me star wars fans <clears throat> the cherubim had a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life so he puts this cherubim he puts this angelic creature with a fire sword that turns every which way but loose to guard against and not allow the man and the woman to eat from this tree of life so they would not live forever in their state of wickedness. Now, they lived to over 900 years old. I mean, that's longer than you and I. Could you imagine living 900 years? Holy smoke. I'm 45 and there's some pains that are still there. Anybody over 45 got some pains this morning when you woke up? Okay, just a couple of you. Every, e- even today in our lives, we can find forgiveness for sin. Now, I, this is the hope. Even in today's culture, even in this moment, in 2024, you can find forgiveness of sins. But sometimes our sins come with a price. Sometimes some of us are going to have to deal with the consequences of our sins. Some of us, maybe even in this room, some of you that within the sound of my voice are still paying for sins that you committed maybe decades ago. And maybe it's not like a physical, but man, maybe it's just gnawing at your, gnawing at your mind. Anybody in the room, just you think about some of the chunk from your past and it just gnaws at you? That's the consequences of sin. That's the consequences of sin. But listen to me. There is hope, dear Christian. The truth is that we are so close to home. We are not far off. We are so close to home. Keep pressing in to Jesus. Stop trying to build your own fig leaves and put your own loincloths on and run to the Father with your sin. Run to the Father with your junk. Run to the Father with your lies and your deceit and your, your just awfulness. And He will make right what has been messed up for so long. Keep diving in deeper into the Scriptures and don't let the world discourage you. Cling closely to the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to Jesus as the one who is the author and the perfecter of your heart. I think of Hebrews chapter 12. And we have read this a lot here. See, I told you we get back in Hebrews. Look at us. Because here's what will happen. And I had, had a gentleman on my podcast this week make, named Mark Salisbury. He's an author. And he, he wrote the book, Forgiving the Nightmare. And this dude from 7 years old to 14 years old had a stepdad that just abused him on every level that you can imagine. For 7 years. And this is, this is the truth is that sometimes even in, you get, even in this life, if you get Jesus, there's still going to be bumps in the road. If you read Hebrews 11 and 12, there's such rich truth in Hebrews 11 and 12. There's, Hebrews 11 is the, is the hall of fame of everybody that's famous in the text. By faith, Abraham, by faith, Enoch, by faith, all these guys, right? All the different guys. And then he, then he gets into the nitty gritty at the end of chapter 11. And 
It talks about Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and, uh, and the prophets who, throughout, who through faith conquered kingdoms and enforced justice and obtained promises and stopped the mouths of lions and quenched the power of the fire and escaped the edge of the sword and were made strong in weakness and became mighty in war and put foreign armies to flight. And he, women, look at this, in verse 36, some women received back their, de- their dead by resurrection. So somebody's husband came back to life. And so here's what happens in modern day Christendom. What we like to do is we like to put the guys and the gals on the platform that are putting foreign armies to fight, that are conquering kingdoms, that are building businesses, that are doing amazing things for the kingdom. And we say, look at that Christian. If you give your heart to Jesus, you'll be just like that. Which maybe. But this is why I love the Bible. Keep reading. This is like a Tarantino film. It like, it like turns all of a sudden just flips on you, right? Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured. What? Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mockings and floggings, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned and they were sawn in two. Listen, listen. conquering kingdoms sounds like a great idea. I'm in. Sawn in two? I don't think so. I don't think I want that one. But here's the truth. All of these people that we see in chapter 11 then flows into chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every weight of sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus as the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despised the shame and is seated at the right hand of God at the uh, the throne of God Here's here's the truth you may conquer kingdoms in this life and put foreign armies to flight praise God Some of you might get sawn in two. Praise God. And we have great, this is the reason the Bible is so amazing, is we have this great cloud of witnesses, the people that in our minds won. But we also have people that have in our minds lost. And for the glory of God, they advance the kingdom. And so we have this great cloud of witnesses of men and women who have overcome. They have overcome Adversity. They had overcome all the things. Some of them just had to die in the process. Right? And what was every one of them doing? What was every single one of them doing? They were looking to Jesus as the author and the perfecter of their lives. They were focused on Jesus. They got off of the holy navel gazing and they got looking directly at the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and they said he's who I want. This is who I want. So we have this great cloud of witnesses of people that have gone on before us and that have won. Not only that, but we live in a day and a time when we can see other men and women who are winning for the cause of Christ. Some of them are conquering kingdoms and some of them are being enslaved for their faith. We've got real access to both groups and they're a great cloud of witnesses to encourage us to say, we're not giving up. We're going to continue to press on. You say, okay, Caleb, I am so messy. You may be flawed, but in Christ, you are never a failure. You're, you're a, a redeemed and rescued child of God. If you've repented of your sins and you've placed your faith and your hope in Christ, you are, yes, experientially flawed. And you are sinful and you are a mess. But you're not a failure because Christ has redeemed you. And what Christ has made clean. Remember in the New Testament, Peter has this conversation with the Lord. And he sees all this unclean stuff in a vision. And Peter's like, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, I'm not going to eat that unclean stuff. Don't give me that pig. And he's like, What I've made clean, don't call dirty. And if God's made you clean, you're clean. If God's forgiven you, you're forgiven. 
You may be flawed. Stop. Listen. Be willing to stop beating yourself up and get your stop and holy navel gazing and get your eyes off of you for a second and look at the person and work of Jesus, who is the the founder and the perfecter of our faith. And as a result of him being the founder and the perfecter of our faith, I'm looking at Jesus and man, I can't believe I get to be a part of this. And in fact, the scripture says that in Romans chapter eight, we are more than conquerors. And we, listen, some of us might get sawn in two, but this is the day that the Lord has made and be like, man, it's all right. For the glory of God, there are men and women today who are dying for their faith. More people die for the Christian faith in 2024 than did back in the Roman Colosseum days. There are pastors right this very moment today that are being drug out of their churches and beat in front of their congregations. Heard a story not too long ago of a church where the authorities, it's a communist country, they rolled in, the authorities rolled into the church service, pulled the pastor and his family out in front of the congregation, and they killed the wife and the child in front of the pastor. Not the pastor, but his wife and kid. You think he's discouraged? You better believe it. What do you got to do in moments like that? Have a motivational, inspirational quote? No. You better hold tight to the person and work of Christ in that moment because you've got nothing else left to hold on to. That's where we are, ladies and gentlemen. And that's the truth of why oftentimes so many people don't like to read the Old Testament because it's got some icky stuff that we like just to roll over and not talk about. But the reality is this is the truth. This is the truth of God's word. There are consequences to our sins. There are consequences to our sins. But there is hope in the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus did not leave Adam and Eve to squander in their environment. He redeems them, reconciles them, and sets them on a path. And then ultimately comes back as a man and he buys back what Adam forfeited. And now because of that, Christ has authority in every realm, heaven and earth. And what are we called to do? Advance the kingdom. What did Jesus pray? I I find it funny. Teresa mentioned this this morning. You didn't know I had this in the sermon. As As part of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What are we to pray for? What are we to long for? What are we to try to advance? The kingdom. Pray, thy kingdom come. Lord, I want to see the kingdom advanced. I want to see the kingdom come. How do we do that? By stepping into dark spaces with the hope of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, it is can and will change the world. Like I said a few weeks ago, you may not change the entire world, but man, you can for sure change your street. Amen? You got access to change your street. Why? Because you know your neighbors. And some of them just bold enough to say, you know, I'm going to drive with you. Come up there. I, I told that to, who did I tell? I, told, I think I said that the other night at men's Bible study. And the guy that was sitting on the couch was like, he looked at Jeremy and goes, you drive 50 miles to go to church? I struggled to drive seven. That's a testimony. He, he sure kind of like owns the dudes in the room. They're like, wait a minute. You go 50 miles? Man, I need to reevaluate my whole life. I struggled to go seven. That's intentionality. That's the, and it, you know what he says? You know what Jeremy says? How much is your soul worth? Like, Bro, preach, man. I'll just step back and let you have it. How much is your soul worth? Your soul worth 50 miles? I thought that was pretty, pretty good. Well, trust in the Word of God today. Trust in the truth of the power of this text because it brings hope for us.
Yes, there's consequences to our sins, but there is everlasting forgiveness in the person and work of Christ. And when we enter into that person and work of Christ, Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, Therefore now there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. So in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the eyes of God Almighty, you are no longer condemned, but you are blessed in Christ. That's good news. Let's stand together.